folks, boy, do I have a treat for you today. We got the letters of St. Peter, St. John, and St. Jude. So these are going to be six letters at the very tail end of the New Testament body of epistles and capped off by the final book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation, which will be next time. So let's get into Peter first. And then we're going to go, because of its similarity to Peter, we're going to jump into Jude, uh, which is after John in the order of New Testament books. But I'm going to sandwich it in there with uh, Peter's letters because 2 Peter and Jude are very similar. Then we're going to deal with uh, John's letters. Uh, so let's start with 1 Peter, five chapters long, written by Peter. Uh, by Peter from Rome to all these different churches in Asia Minor uh, that he lists there for us. And he says that he's writing it from Babylon, which everybody interprets as Rome. That's like early Christian code language. Okay, and not just Christian, Jewish. Because uh, in the Jewish literature of the time, you also have these mysterious references to Rome as Babylon. So that was a way to refer to Rome. And in Revelation that we'll look at next time, uh, we're going to see chapter 17, eight, 17 and 18 describe the whore of Babylon. And it's described as this woman, uh, but she has seven hills and ten kings. We all know what city is built on seven hills, the city of Rome. So it's Rome we're talking about here. John was talking about in Revelation, uh, equating the whore of Babylon with the city of Rome. Uh, and now Peter is going to say he's writing from Babylon, but we know he means Rome. Now there was a fire in 64, okay, that uh, Nero the emperor blamed on the Christians, and then that started a state authorized, state-sanctioned persecution of the early church in Rome, led to a lot of martyrdoms. Most likely Peter and Paul were martyred at that time uh, during that persecution, but this letter is presumably written before that, but very close, maybe in the early 60s. Uh, and Paul, or excuse me, Peter seems to be writing to this church that appears to be suffering, because that's really the major theme of the letter, trying to console them in their sufferings in, uh, you know, modern-day Turkey or then Asia Minor. All these churches, uh, some of which Paul have been to, they're suffering. Just ostracization, okay? Not necessarily any state-sanctioned persecution because there was none coming down from the emperor, not until... I mean, there was a lo the local one in the mid-60s that was sanctioned by Nero, but that was just for Rome, kind of a local persecution of Christians. But uh, in terms of an empire-wide decree by an emperor systematically persecuting Christians, that didn't come until Domitian in the 90s. So um, what persecution are they undergoing there in Asia Minor? Just the persecution of becoming Christians, they're very small, okay, and they don't have any leverage socially, and they're just um, different, you know. When people are different, we don't like it. Think about it. And when they're trying to be all holy, suddenly they're converted. Now they're all holy, holier than now. Uh, we just start to resent them. It's like you're sipping lemonade on your porch or patio, and you look across the way, and there's one of your neighbors painting their house and cleaning up the yard. What do you do? A lot of times our default position is to resent them. So we begin to resent them as we sip our lemonade. Who do they think they are? Clean up. They think they're better than everybody else. Here they're trying to do something to improve their world. But, you know, the people around you, when you're trying to grow and um, do something good, oftentimes, you know, we can, some, we can resent them. So that seems to be what the early church is struggling with social marginalization and ostracization. I mean, they're just upsetting the social order too because as they win converts, they're pulling them away from other communities where they were devoting their time and energies and probably their money and their resources. Talent and treasure is going now into this body of Christian believers that was invested somewhere else and those people are going to resent that and as well. So, Look at the uh, reaction Paul had in Thessalonica. I mean, they drove him out after only three weeks. The Jews drove Paul out. Look at um, 
the reaction uh, to Paul in Ephesus where you had this guy Demetrius in the Acts of the Apostles, a silversmith, and he and a, this whole guild of silversmiths have been making money off of the sale of these little replicas of the temple of Artemis, this seventh wonder of the world. Uh, and their business suffered as a result of all these people converting to Christianity and drawn away from the worship of this god of Art, this god Artemis, goddess Artemis. So, boy, they formed a riot and made Paul's life miserable and really hurt uh, his apostolate there in Ephesus. But, uh, but anyway, so look, they're suffering there, and, and Peter comes with a message of joy and hope in the midst of their suffering trying to secure them in their identity, uh, which is kind of the first couple chapters uh, and the most of the first couple chapters. And then, okay, how do we live out this identity? So he secures their identity and then shows them kind of, a, gives them a moral exhortation as to how to live in the household of God. Uh, so Babylon, yeah, and... Um, it's written through Silas or Silvanus. We talked about last time. Paul, or excuse me, Peter. At the end, you see that uh, Silvanus or Silas identifies himself uh, as writing this thing. So he's his amanuensis or scribe uh, for Peter, somebody that we know was connected with the Pauline ministry. Silas or Silvanus. Peter also mentions. My son Mark at the end of this letter, which is interesting. So, so here we have Simon Peter. Now we're going to focus on for a couple letters here. These important letters in the New Testament. Uh, he's going to talk about suffering, as I said, and he's going to focus on the suffering servant of Isaiah in a very special way. As a matter of fact, he is going to quote the Old Testament quite a bit, like eighteen quotations in a five-chapter letter. 18 times he's going to quote the Old Testament and a lot of important quotes from the suffering servant songs of the prophet Isaiah. He's also going to add to that with like 25 allusions to the Old Testament. So chock full of the Old Testament. Now, uh, let's actually, um, one final note on all this. I just find it interesting that Simon, who was initially named the reed. You know, that's what Simon means in Hebrew is reed. Okay, not something that you want to support yourself on. You don't want to put your full weight on a reed. You don't want to lean on it and trust it because it will collapse on you. That's not something that's very strong and uh, uh, something that um, you can trust. Now, um, his name is changed to rock. So Simon Peter is literally reed rock. Uh, so the guy who was a reed becomes a rock. And the guy who was, curiously enough, trying to divert our Lord from his cross, uh, trying to uh, diverge from suffering uh, in the gospel accounts, is now encouraging us in our sufferings, encouraging all these churches and the whole of the body of Christ to suffer patiently and endure and giving us this pep talk in the midst of our earthly sufferings, the very guy who was trying to dissuade our Lord from going to Jerusalem to the cross. Lord, this must not happen to you. Get behind me, Satan. Uh, so just a little irony there uh, that uh, these are two different people here. You see the conversion process uh, for Peter is very real, very evident, very powerful. That's why I can relate to him so much. I just love Peter. His realness and his humanity is very endearing. Uh, this I have a special heart for Peter. I just there's a lot of things I'll say about Peter as I move along here. Let's get into the actual letter. Uh, so starts off. Um, uh, by mentioning that it's to the exiles of the dispersion. Now, what is this? Uh, first of all, being in exile is a major theme in, in these letters, particularly this first letter. Mentions it like three times. That we're exiles, sojourning in a foreign land. Um, and aliens, which we'll get to more specifically. I want to talk about that. Alien, what that word means, but uh, but what is this dispersion? That's a word that is very Jewish. 
It's very interesting that St. Peter chooses to use this word dispersion uh, because that's something the Jews used to refer to themselves. You know, the 8th century, the, the uh, 10 northern tribes of Israel were dispersed amongst the nations by the Assyrians uh, when they conquered the northern tribe of Israel, 10 northern tribes of Israel, sorry, but the kingdom of Israel in the north consisting of 10 tribes was dispersed all over the world and basically went out of human history. And then you have uh, the 6th century um, dispersion of the Jews that occurred in and around the uh, Babylonian captivity period of approximately 70 years. Uh, so these are the two major dispersions that Peter's making reference to here. And this is something the Jews uh, referred to uh, themselves, this word, um, being dispersed all throughout the nations. Well, um, and exiles from their homeland of Israel. Uh, so this is a Jewish concept, a Jewish term. Now Peter's using it for Christians. So this isn't necessarily a call back to the promised land of Israel, a patch of ground in the ancient Near East. That's not what Peter's getting at. He's not saying, consoling them and saying, I know you're exiles now, but, uh, you know, in this dispersion amongst the nations, but someday the Lord will return us to uh, this geographical location of the ancient Near East we know as Palestine or Israel. Okay, that's not what Peter's saying. He's saying... Ultimately, what's behind this is the true promised land is heaven. Uh, this is a spiritual, a new spiritual interpretation of this Jewish term dispersion. Now Peter is applying it to all Christians, Jew and Gentile, that we're all exiles in dispersion amongst the nations. And our true promised land that we're trying to get back to during this sojourn is heaven. All right, moving on, makes a beautiful reference to the Trinity here, God the Father, the Spirit, and Jesus Christ. And then um, mentions this unique word, born anew. Uh, translated born anew, it's really anageneo, okay? Anageneo is one word. Guess what? This is so interesting, this idea of being born anew, generated anew, anageneo. Uh, is actually not used anywhere, not only in the New Testament, but the Old Testament Greek translation, the Septuagint. You don't find this word there either. This is unique to Peter. He uses a, a number of different terms that are completely unique or very rarely found anywhere else. And here's one that isn't found anywhere, Anageneo. So cool. Um, this idea of being born anew uh, is going to be a theme here, that we've been baptized. Uh, he's, you know, that's really what he's referring to, that we've been born again, born anew. He says it twice here in verse 1, ver, uh, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 3, and chapter 1, verse 23. Uh, he uses this unique sounding word. And born anew to a living hope through the resurrection, our inheritance. Uh, so now moving on, he's going to talk about suffering for the first time here. In this you rejoice. Very, very upbeat here a letter telling us to rejoice. Though now for a little while you may have to suffer various trials. It's kind of nonchalant. That's the way I kind of read it. You know, you may have to suffer various trials from time to time down here, you know. Uh, so that the genuineness of your faith more precious than gold which though perishable is tested by fire, may redound to the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So uh, definitely kind of nonchalant. And at the end, he kind of says the same thing in chapter 5. And after you've suffered a little while, hey, after you've suffered a little while, you know, you get the inheritance. And believe me, it's worth it. Uh, you'll be fine. Hang in there. Uh, that's kind of what the saints would say to us if they could speak to us. They'd say, you know what, folks? We were down there. I suffered terribly. I died of cancer, a slow, miserable death of pancreatic cancer, and I would do it all over again. I would do it a thousand times to get what I'm experiencing, what I'm, where I am right now, to get to where I am. If you only knew where I am, once you're here, you'll understand when you get here, you'll understand and you'll look, have a totally different perspective. Like our Lord said, it's like a woman giving birth. When you're experiencing the childbirth, uh, 
It's painful, but once that baby's delivered, you forget about it. Forget about it. It's uh, terrible down here for the time being, but it's just a little while. After you've suffered a little bit, uh, you'll, uh, you'll be all right. So now, um, moving on, he says that um, without having seen him, you love him, though you do not now see him, you believe in him. I like this because uh, Peter loves our Lord. If, we, if there's one thing we know about, our, our, about Peter is how much he loves our Lord. I mean, he's ready to just dive in, plunge in anywhere. He's the one charging to the tomb on the day of resurrection. He's sprinting there with John, the two of them, uh, just plunging in. He's the first one to plunge into the tomb. Uh, he's the one that climbs out of the boat and walks on the water. Unbelievable. In the middle of the night, in a stormy, a rough sea, in the Sea of Galilee, Peter has the audacity and the nerve to get out of that boat and start walking towards our Lord. Loves the Lord. He's crazy for our Lord, and our Lord asked him three times in John's Gospel, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Peter loves the Lord so much with all his heart. When our Lord, the risen Lord, is walking down the shore, the Sea of Galilee, in John's Gospel, what does Peter do? Once John recognizes that that's the Lord, Peter puts his clothes on and jumps into the water and starts swimming for the shore. He's just ready to plunge in and do anything to get to our Lord. He loves the Lord so much he doesn't want to be executed in the very same way he uh, makes it very clear that he just wants to be crucified upside down because he doesn't deserve to be crucified right side up like his Lord was. So Peter loves the Lord and he's telling us that without having seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And when he's saying that, what's behind that uh, is this... Um, tremendous love of St. Peter, and he's admiring, he sees it in other people, he um, and is affirming it. You love the Lord too. I see it in your hearts, how much you love the Lord, and you've never even seen him. I have. Um, now, uh, moving on here, notice how he says that the Spirit of Christ is what enabled these Old Testament prophets to, pro to prophesy, okay? Uh, just interesting here uh, in terms of the inspired word of God here. It was the spirit of Christ within them when predicting the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory. Uh, <clears throat> so there's some interesting things connecting this with Second Peter, a very important quote regarding inspiration of sacred scripture. And this is interesting there. Now, set your hope fully upon the grace that is coming to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Set your hope fully. That's something to take to prayer. Uh, and gird up your minds as obedient children. Once again, conduct yourselves with fear through the time of your exile. We're going to be judged according to our deeds. We should conduct ourselves with fear during this exile. You have been born anew, anageneo, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. The Word of the Lord abides forever. The Word is the good news which was preached to you, not written down in the book form of a book, uh, but uh, actually it's a living Word, and it's transmitted both in written form and oral form. And uh, in this case, this word of God, which is abiding and living, this living and abiding word of God that has given us this rebirth, this anageneo, uh, this imperishable word that abides forever. It's the good news which was preached to you and it's still being preached to you, to me, to all of us. Now, chapter two, uh, he's going to make this reference we always hear about about babies, thinking of us as little babies. Read Psalm 131 in conjunction with this, okay? Like a child on a, a weaned child on its mother's lap. Uh, this is how the posture we want to take into prayer uh, to just be little children and just 
uh, search for this, um, uh, like newborn babes, long for the pure spiritual milk. That by it, you may grow up to salvation. For you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. That's a difficult word to translate kindness, but I did a little word study on it. It's kind of like, I think it's a little word play going on here because it's actually a common slave's name because it means useful. Um, somebody who is productive, that's well suited for a task or um, somebody that's useful. Uh, this word krestos, it sounds a lot like Christos, but there's uh, C-H-R-E-S-T-O-S. Uh, so anyway, interesting. Uh, I think a little word play is going on here. For you have tasted the Crestos of the Lord. Because um, if you remember that edict, uh, forget who pronounced on that edict, but uh, when they kicked all the Jews, was it Nero? Uh, in the late 50s, when they kicked all the Jews out, that's when Priscilla and Aquila left Rome. When he got sick of it, the emperor just uh, ordered this edict and said, get, get rid of all the Jews. And uh, very interesting. It was, it was over this guy, Crestos. See, there was confusion in Rome about this guy, Crestos. And that mistake in mis, you know, this, this uh, reference to the Christ, the Christos, as a Crestos, that confusion coming from the Roman emperor himself in his official edict. Uh, that probably became a joke. Um, and, uh, or, yeah. So, anyway, I think that uh, Peter might be referring to that when he says Christos here. Uh, but anyway, holy priesthood, holy nation, chosen race. These are the ways that Peter's going to describe the church of the living God. That's incredible. Don't take that for granted. These are treasured um, titles of Israel that she takes to herself and prides herself in it, rightly she should. Think of this, the Exodus event. During the Exodus chapter 19, God says, all the earth is mine, but you shall be to me, speaking to this newly fashioned nation that he has brought out of slavery in Egypt and constituted it now, this confederation of 12 tribes, has been uh, become a nation under the authority of Moses now. They're united as his people. And he says, the Lord says to them, for all the earth is mine and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. It's an incredibly profound, poignant moment in the history of Israel. And these words were treasured, uh, known by everybody that these, this was the chosen race the holy nation, the holy or royal priesthood and uh, of God on the face of the earth. And now Peter is reapplying them, repurposing these profound terms uh, to describe the church of God, uh, the church that Christ founded, that all of us are part of this chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation. Incredible, really. Um, now, I want to just focus on this word here for a second in chapter 2, verse 11. Beloved, I beseech you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh that wage war against your soul. I want to focus on the word aliens here. Beloved, I beseech you as aliens and exiles. Guess what the word alien is, folks? Paroikos, okay, in Greek comes from two words. The prepositional prefix para means alongside, okay? Uh, and then this word oikos, it's, it's, it's joined to this word oikos, which means house, okay? Um, like the word oikonomia, economy. Where we get the English word economy comes from the Greek oikonomia. Oikos, house, and nomos, law. Okay, and you elide those two Greek words, oikonomia, and you get this distribution of the household goods, laws pertaining to the house or to the household, uh, economy. Okay, um, now paroikos means it basically implies that we're in a situation where we are living alongside others in their house. 
that we're literally guests in somebody else's house. We're aliens. And no one likes to be a paraoikos. Uh, it's uncomfortable. All right. You like to go to somebody else's house. As you get older, you get more and more set in your ways and you just want your own bed and you know your, your CPAP machine and your comforter and your pillow that hits you in the right spot and the sounds that your room makes. You know everything and it's a comfortable, safe environment where you can rest and sleep and being in somebody else's house or in some motel with scratchy sheets that smells like cigarette smoke and or in somebody else's house with who knows what. I mean, it's just... Uh, when you're a kid, it's fun to spend the night at somebody else's house, but as you grow up, you don't really want to be a paraoikos anymore. Um, comfortable in our own space, in our own house. We don't want to be in somebody else's house necessarily living there. Not for very long, anyway. Remember what Benjamin Franklin famously said. Uh, fish and guests, house guests, start to stink after three days. Uh, so... You know, we're aliens. This word paroikos, guess what? It's where we get the word parochial. Parochial vicar. It's what we call an associate pastor, a priest. Uh, it's helping the pastor in that particular parish, parochial situation. So parochial school. Parochial means parish, okay? It's where we get the word parish. Uh, paroikos. Yeah, that's right. Um, your parish, my parish, all of us that belong to a parish, we are a bunch of aliens living in this house here, this cosmos uh, that is not ours ultimately. It's not where we belong. Uh, it's not our ultimate home. Um, and we're just sojourners through a foreign land. We're exiles and uh, we're not dwelling in our own house. Uh, so very interesting way to think about all of us in our parishes as paroikos or paroikoi together. Now, the stuff he says here about servants in chapter 2, verse 18 to the end is interesting, and we got to make a point about that. That the word servant is doulos in Greek, and it has a range of meaning. Sometimes it's translated as slave, straight up slave. Uh, but rounding up a bunch of people from wherever and putting collars around their neck and chains on them and uh, dragging them off to a ship or something like that, that's not the only form of slavery, okay? So when we hear slave, that's immediately what we think of today. But at the time, there were many different forms of slavery. Some people, it was not forced on them. They voluntarily entered into it. They were forced to... Uh, because of uh, their indebtedness. Uh, they were on the poverty line and they deliberately, uh, voluntarily placed themselves uh, under the custody of uh, someone, uh, a master, to become their bond servant or a slave or servant. Uh, they bound themselves to them. So anyway, when we hear servant, Slave, oftentimes it's translated both ways, this word doulos, as either servant or slave. But it's not, uh, but we got to just see that it was a very common institution in the ancient world, and it doesn't always mean they were grabbed, snatched from some other country. That might be the case, but not necessarily always the case. So incredible stuff he says in this letter about innocent suffering and how we are joined in a very special way to our Lord. He is in solidarity with those who suffer innocently. And we've all experienced it at work. We've been slandered at work. Uh, somebody trying to undermine us, backstab us, overstep us uh, to get something they want. Uh, there's all kind of selfishness in the workplace or in the schoolyard or wherever we are. Human selfishness and pride rears its ugly head and all of us suffer innocently and that can be a complete outrage to us and cut against all our instincts and make us apoplectic out of our minds with rage and a desire for revenge to be vindicated. Lots of movies about this kind of thing, you know, when people suffer unjustly and then they come back and get revenge. Uh, and everybody, uh, like, 
can think of so many different movies, but common theme in Hollywood that we all relish. Uh, and, um, but if you do right, St. Peter says, and suffer for it, you take it patiently. You have God's approval when you're doing right and you're suffering unjustly and you take it patiently. Uh, you have God's approval. Christ also suffered for you in this manner. And when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he trusted to him who judges justly. This is a tough one to live, man. This is really hitting us where we live. But uh, this business about suffering, and if one is approved, one is approved if mindful of God, he endures pain while suffering unjustly. Enduring pain while suffering unjustly. Uh, incredible. Now, um, on down the line, he's going to talk about wives and husbands. The inner beauty of a wife. How husbands should treat their wives. Um, and I like this bit here uh, about having a tender heart and a humble mind. We should all have a tender heart and a humble mind. Wow, I think... Peter just described himself because I think he was a tough dude, you know, and uh, probably presented himself in a very tough manner, but I bet he was tenderhearted. Um, he was chosen as a leader, so he must have had some charism about him that uh, lended itself to leadership, and he was, um, there was a certain gravitas about Peter, a certain presence, and, uh, you know, but he was he was probably choleric -y and uh, but he was tender hearted. Peter was tender hearted. I know he was because I'll tell you uh, this word here, splanknitsomai. Okay, splankia is like your guts, your inward parts. It's another word for heart. Uh, sometimes it's translated heart. The seat of the emotions is not up here but actually in your guts. Don't you feel your guts lift and move? You have what's known as a visceral reaction to something. Uh, when you're moved emotionally, uh, a viscera in Latin is your guts. It's your splankia. It's the same thing, splanknos. Uh, your viscera, a visceral, re you know, somebody who's eviscerated. Yeah, they're, they're sliced open and all their guts fall out, eviscerated. Uh, well, a visceral experience is the same as this verb, splunk, it's oh my, it's like you're moved with pity. Guess where this word appears a lot in the New Testament besides uh, Peter here? Uh, that word is found in Mark's gospel. Our Lord often exhibits this quality of splunk, it's oh my. Guess who wrote it? Mark, his son Mark, he talks about at the end of this letter here. My son Mark. And um, everybody believes that basically uh, Mark's gospel was more or less the memoirs of St. Peter. So St. Peter is describing our Lord oftentimes as being moved with pity, having this visceral reaction to things, being tender-hearted is how it's often translated into English. And we're encouraged to be uh, tender-hearted as well. It's actually... Uh, Eusplanknos, okay, tender heart. Having a tender heart comes from that Greek verb, splankitsomai, which we find in Mark's gospel. But in this case, it's a noun, a tender heart. You add that little EU on the front, and it means basically good. Um, it's kind of tricky, but basically uh, it's an intensifying add-on uh, that basically means good. Having a tender heart and a humble mind. Again, I just love this because I think Peter was so humble. He was so humbled. I even saw a fresco recently, a mosaic from the 4th century of Peter and a rooster. How would you like to screw up by denying our Lord? And then this is like, uh, you know, every time you walk down the street, people are going, ooh, 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 ooh. You know, uh, Poor Peter. I mean, this event of his denial of our Lord three times haunted him his whole life, but he profited from that humiliation 
more than we can imagine, St. Francis of Assisi said, your humiliations are of utmost value. They are pure gold. We can grow so much from our humiliations if we embrace them and learn from them and harness that power. We can grow. Uh, St. Peter became very humble. So he says, have a tender heart and a humble mind. Uh, and if anybody reviles you, bless them. Anybody reviles you, bless them. I've always wanted to do that. I'm never quick enough on the draw. Um, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. That's wisdom right there. We don't want to be contentious. We don't want to provoke people and be provocative um, and uh, contentious and all that kind of thing. Um, but we should defend uh, the faith, contend for the faith. St. Jude's going to say, always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who calls you to account for the hope that is in you. Uh, St. Paul said the same thing. So St. Paul said this in 2 Timothy 1, 2.15. He said, uh, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Um, we got to be ready. Always be prepared to make a defense. To make a defense and to do it as a workman who's been approved, able to handle the word of God without shame, rightly handling the word of truth. Uh, that's what we're all striving. We should all be striving to do. Um, now, moving on, mysterious passage here in chapter 3, verse 19, where he's talking about our Lord going into the realm of the dead and preaching to the spirits in prison who formerly did not obey at the time of Noah. That's a very mysterious passage in Peter that has been debated since the early church. I don't know. I A simple reading of it to me is these are souls that... Uh, have not destroyed the temple of God within them, and therefore God has not destroyed uh, souls that you know can be released from their sin. They're in Abraham's bosom, wherever they are. They have, uh, like 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about those who've destroyed the temple of God that they are. And uh, these are individuals, I think, who are in a purgatorial state um, the work of their life is burned up, Second, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But they themselves will, uh, are going to be saved, but they will suffer loss, though, and they'll only be saved as through fire, St. Paul says. Um, and maybe that's who uh, is being preached to here. I don't know, um, but that's what I get from it. That's the simple explanation for me. I'm no scripture scholar, but... And when he went to preach to the spirits in prison who formerly did not obey, he's not preaching to souls that are damned, uh, but rather the souls that are in this um, state of waiting for redemption, uh, so uh, who are suffering loss of the beatific vision and uh, who have been disobedient, yeah, um, but who have not destroyed the temple of God that they are. Uh, they are. God is going to rescue them from this state uh, now through His Son, Jesus Christ. And moving on, the human passions by the world of God live. Uh, I like this here. When he talks about you know, they, how surprised people are going to be. It's people who are going to be surprised, uh, the, the Gentiles, these peoples around us, when we don't, indulge our passions anymore when we're not out there inch, 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 inch. Uh, when we're not going to the discotheques and uh, living that life uh, that the world is running after of chasing a big bank account having this huge house and a Ferrari whatever it is something worldly something um, uh, that is what the Gentiles like to do. Let the time pass suffice for doing those types of things. And, you know, they're going to look at you and be surprised. Um, they're surprised that you do not now join them in the same wild profligacy. And they're going to abuse you for it. So that's some of the suffering that Paul's tell, describing here. 
uh, the, the cause of their suffering. This is the cause of it. And he's trying to strengthen them in this commitment that they have made um, that they might live in the spirit like God. Love covers a multitude of sins. We've heard that before in James. Uh, do not be surprised at this fiery ordeal down here, folks. Don't be surprised. You're suffering for a little while, various trials, okay, for a little while. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you to prove you as though something strange were happening to you. Why me? I can't believe God let this happen to me. I hear that so much. Oh, my gosh. People are always saying that kind of thing. Like, this is so wrong. I can't believe I'm mad at God, blah, blah, blah. We're surprised at these things because it's a prosperity gospel that's gotten into our thinking, invaded our thinking, and we don't understand the cross, the mystery of the cross. We don't understand our faith, um, and the cross is at the heart of our faith. Read the New Testament and uh, renounce this phony uh, prosperity gospel that's out there right now and that we're being punished. Bad things happen to good people. Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal which comes upon you to prove you. Even our Lord suffered. Don't forget, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Who do we think we are when we're suffering and maybe even we're suffering unjustly? How can God let this happen to me? This is so wrong. This feels so bad and so wrong. How do you think our Lord felt on the cross, folks? Did that feel good? Did that feel bad? So there's a fiery ordeal here, but rejoice, St. Peter says, insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Suffer according to God's will. Things that are outside our control, that is part of God's will. Coming down the pike, uh, we just have to take it. Uh, now, um, do right and entrust their souls to faithful creator, elders, humility. Once again, all this talk about humility. Humility towards one another. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Uh, this is coming from a man who was humble and who gets the whole humility thing. That is the key virtue the saints always say when asked, what's the greatest virtue? Humility. What's the next greatest virtue? Humility. What's the third greatest virtue? Humility is the foundation of all the virtues. St. Peter gets that. He ha he's had to learn it by the school of hard knocks, putting his foot in his mouth and um, doing and saying dumb things. Uh, painful, painful humiliation, but tremendous grace uh, from those th events. Cast all your care, your anxieties on him, for he cares about you. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith. Uh, so, so what I'll end on there with First Peter is that's a famous passage here. The devil's a bully, and he's a junkyard dog on a short chain. So we just stay out of the radius of that thing of that dog, that flea-bitten, mangy, covered with ticks, dog, junkyard dog. He's tied off to a stake in the ground. He can't get us unless we go wandering over there and fall into mortal sin and come into his radius of his chain. Um, <clears throat> he is uh, a bully. It's basically what St. Peter's saying here. He doesn't like, bullies don't like when people stand up to him. And if you want to get rid of a bully, I'll tell you what. You uh, stand up to them and they'll leave you alone. Be sober, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour, someone to bully. Resist him firm in your faith. Knowing that the experience of suffering is required of your brotherhood throughout the world. Now, um... Uh, Let's move on to 2 Peter real quick, uh, and uh, we're going to keep rolling. So let's get into 2 Peter here. It's only three chapters long. Was it written by Peter? That is 
the question because it's had a contested authorship since the early days of the church. Uh, it's been questioned, called into question, and whether or not it should be included in the canon since ancient times. But it eventually was, uh, which means that it was of apostolic origin, that it was consistent with the apostolic teaching. What's curious about it, I mean, is the fact that he uses different vocabulary. There's a different grammatical structure than First Peter. Uh, so, and he doesn't quote the Old Testament. He just uses biblical stories to prove his point, but you don't see uh, how it's very different than First Peter in that way. And second chapter of Second Peter is like identical almost to the letter of Jude. So there's a literary dependency or relationship there. Who borrowed from who? Uh, no one really knows. Uh, the most plausible answer is that Peter borrowed from Jude, Jude's letter. Uh, but, um, but anyway, and the fact is that there were spurious writings, you know, uh, pseudepigraphal writings that were writing on, uh, as though they came from Peter. Uh, we have a gospel of Peter that was floating around in the early church, the Acts of Peter and the Apocalypse of Peter, all of which the church determined were bogus. So I guess that just kind of cast an air of suspicion on anything that purported to be from Peter uh, was uh, held suspect. And uh, But eventually, this second letter of Peter, thank goodness, made it into the canon because it has some real zingers in here. Uh, so glad it's part of the New Testament. I love it. And for me, I have no problem with Peter's authorship. I'm going to say um, Peter wrote this because uh, even if some people think it's far-fetched, you can explain away like St. Jerome in the 4th century said, look, some of these differences can just be explained away by the simple fact that Peter used a different amanuensis, the Greek word for scribe, person that you pay, who transcribes... Um, and puts down in writing your letter, uh, which is given orally. Uh, so they polish the Greek, and they have a different um, style of their own. Uh, so uh, he could have just used a different one. This is a simple answer to that problem. Now, uh, was it sent to the churches in Asia Minor again? I guess doesn't really say. See, Peter explicitly says that in the first letter, but this one he refers to having written to you again. He says, this is now the second letter that I have written to you. Uh, so presumably he's referring to the first letter that we just heard, heard about. Um, <clears throat> but who knows? Um, so let's presume it's sent to the same churches in Asia Minor. Uh, but as all these letters uh, in this back half of the, um, or this, back, this final portion of the New Testament after the letter to the Hebrews, James, John, Jude, Peter, they're all these Catholic epistles, seven of these Catholic epistles that really ultimately they're uh, meant to be for everyone and encircle, to encircle the earth, an encyclical letter, a Catholic letter that pertains to the whole, which is what kata holocaust means, uh, pertaining to the whole. So for everyone. Now the con the context of this is that there are opponents. Uh, there's problems in Asia Minor. Uh, and uh, Pete, Paul had been dealing with that in the letter to the Colossians, in the letter to the Ephesians and Galatians. I mean, these are polemical letters, or at least Colossians and Galatians definitely are. Uh, and uh, so these churches in Asia Minor were beset with some problems, some significant problems of these uh, heresies that were creeping in, the syncretism uh, or mixing and blending of various elements. There were people who were slipping in these secret heresies into the church, trying to slip them in in this syncretistic way. Uh, things that were doctrinally incorrect, that did not jive with the preaching of the apostles, with the doctrine of the faith, that we must contend for. We're going to hear next from Jude. Contend for the faith delivered once for all to the saints. And uh, this is a very dangerous thing. St. John is, is going to fight against it when we get into John's letters. Paul fights against it. Peter's fighting against it. Jude's fighting against it. Doctrinal orthodoxy, right thinking, is absolutely imperative. These heresies are nothing to sniff at. They are destructive, tremendously destructive. And... Uh, False teachers, false prophets. 
Uh, so we have to guard. Remember, we talked about that. We got to guard the church uh, from these sorts of things and not be so open-minded that we're naive. Um, so Peter certainly is not. So the opponents are the skeptics that deny perhaps um, Jesus' divinity, uh, or they definitely are denying the reality of sin and judgment. That's something we can definitely relate to in our own time. Uh, and the idea that God is going to hold us accountable for our deeds, uh, this is something that some people, maybe it was some sort of skeptical, Epicurean philosophy, pre-Gnostic philosophy, but it basically it was a liber libertinism libertines they were like libertines who said you can do whatever we want down here uh and uh we've uh, we've been saved and god doesn't really care what we do and how we live there's not going to be a final judgment necessarily that is what peter is going to lamb based so what are the themes of the second letter overall theme is rel the reliability of god's word and this eschatological urgency that we have to energetically and with great eagerness grow in holiness uh, in preparation of Christ's coming uh, and the last things. You know, this urgent appeal uh, to live an eschatological life that's focused to, the, be, to uh, the last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Uh, that's a mark of a Christian, this eschatological urgency for all times. Uh, energetic eagerness. Now, what is the structure of this letter? It's nice because it uh, it's very simple in its structure. You got three chapters and you got three basic topics covered in each chapter. The first chapter is a reminder of the truth of God's word. Uh, there's some awesome things it says in there about God's word. Second chapter is going to lambaste these false teachers. Uh, in great detail, and that's where it bears a great deal of similarity with the letter to Jude. Not the most pleasant reading, Jude, or the second letter, uh, second chapter of 2 Peter, but, um, but it's part of the scriptures. Chapter 3, holiness of life, so moral exhortation. Uh, so similarities between Jude and Peter, I already talked about that. Um, and I think we're ready to just get into the letter the actual letter now simon peter a servant and apostle of jesus christ servant and apostle simon peter simon peter the reed rock i already told you simon means reed in hebrew petros or peter uh, means rock so reed rock i would like to have that name uh to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours so he's greeting the members of this church and all churches, everybody, for the whole history of the church, 2,000 years later, he's talking to us. We have a faith of equal standing with him who walked and lived with the Lord for three years with the Son of God. That's incredible. That is a, a really humble statement. Not lording it over us, not you know taking on an air of superiority. Uh, and uh, No, he says, you have a faith of equal standing with ours. Um, it's almost like he's, uh, you know, admires those who see, who believe without seeing or love without having um, known him. Without having seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you believe in him. Uh, this is something Peter is, is admires and is all, in awe of uh, in others. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. And then moving on here, listen to this. This is 2 Peter 1, 4, one of the most important passages in the scriptures. I'm telling you, this verse is a bombshell. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 4. Listen to this, folks. That you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature, folks. You heard right. We're going to be sharers or partakers of the divine nature. That's what St. Peter is telling us, the rock. Um, now, that means we're going to be sharing the nature of God. That's far more than just the traditional understanding of Christianity. I mean, the simp 
super, the overly simplistic uh, sense that uh, Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall and God just simply set him back up on the wall. He redeemed, bought him back, uh, canceled the debt of his sin, repaired him and stuck him back on the wall. No, actually, uh, God shared his nature with poor Humpty Dumpty. He not only healed him, uh, forgave his sins, uh, but he shared his nature and made Humpty Dumpty his very own son. Divine sonship, folks. The spirit of our Heavenly Father, the spirit of sonship dwelling in us, St. Paul says in Romans chapter 8, crying out within us, Abba, Father. Divine sonship. Do you not realize, we'll hear in John, that you are the children of God? Uh, this is... Um, our ultimate identity and how do we become sons? What's a son? A son shares the same nature with his father. We're not just servants like Moses was the servant of the Lord. We're more than servants. That's it. That's the transition point from the Old Testament to the New Testament. This is the beauty of it, uh, that it has far exceeded the Old Covenant now. This New Covenant, this New Testament is about sonship, not about servanthood. Uh, that's what, the theme running through our Lord's preaching and through the whole New Testament, okay? And uh, like we heard before in Hebrews, you know, Moses was like the house. Now we have the builder coming. Jesus is superior to Moses, and he's going to institute a new covenant that is going to make us the children, the sons of God, sharers of God's nature. It's unimaginable. I don't think anybody was expecting that necessarily. Uh, that we were going to literally enter into the inner communion of the blessed Trinity, that that was our destiny, not just to return to Eden uh, and to be set back up on the wall. Uh, no, what we have is far greater than what Adam and Eve enjoyed in that parad paradisal garden of Eden. When we go to heaven and become sharers of the divine nature, we will, we will be like God. My goodness. Uh, we just can't imagine what that's going to be like. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard. I heard this Vietnam vet on the internet giving his testimony about a near-death experience he had during the, the war. He was shot down in a helicopter, and he just described how he was shot. He was on the ground. His buddy was with him who was shot also, and uh, he, he completely went out and died. And his buddy drug him two and a half hours out of the jungle fighting the whole way and I got him rescued but he died and he went through this tunnel and entered into this light that he knew was God and the light was love uh, and God spoke to him and he felt like he had like you hear a lot of times people describe a near-death experience like instantaneous infused knowledge of everything and uh, this incredible grasp of all things uh, he felt like his own words, a super God. Now, that starts to sound like Mormonism, like where we're going to become gods on other planets or something like that. But I'll tell you, Catholicism is radical, man. We believe in theosis, okay? Deification, divinization, uh, that we are going to be partakers of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, 4. Become literally the children of God, sharing God's nature, his sons by adoption, Okay, small s, not by nature. There's only one son of God by nature. But in Christ, we have shared the inner life of the blessed Trinity. We're part of this family. We are in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name, the name of God, in hearing in our soul. Uh, we are members of this family as uh, bearing the spirit of sonship. So here we have paragraph 460 of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Um, oh, just to wrap up, that Vietnam soldier said that when, when God appeared to him, he was exultant in this feeling of, of elation that he was some sort of super God when he experienced uh, leaving his body and this tremendous grasp of all things he suddenly had and this experience of freedom uh, and knowledge was so intense that he thought, I must be some kind of God. Um Honestly, it's not far from the truth. Um, we're not replacing God. We're not saying we're equal to God at all. 
But by grace, God has shared his nature with us. Let's look at paragraph 460 of the Catechism. It begins by quoting 2 Peter 1, 4, the word became flesh to make us partakers of the divine nature. Then listen to what it says. For this is why the word became man and the son of God became the son of man. So that man, by entering into communion with the word and thus receiving divine sonship, might become a son of God. Small s, son. Um, now it's going to quote two heavy hitters here. St. Athanasius, this great doctor of the church from the 4th century, the hero of the Council of Nicaea, uh, the defense of Christ's divinity, uh, which came at Nicaea. And St. Athanasius, this bishop of Alexandria, says this, For the Son of God became man so that we might become God. Now that is um, eye-opening for some Catholics who have never heard this before, but this is central to our Catholic faith. This is right out of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, out of the teachings of the Second Vatican Council, okay? Um, it's shocking, but it's true. Let's quote another doctor of the Church alongside St. Athanasius, the great 12th century doctor of the Church, St. Thomas Aquinas says, quoted in the Catechism again, the only begotten Son of God wanting to make us sharers in His divinity assumed our nature so that he made man might make men gods. Awesome, folks. Divinization, deification, or what's known by the Greeks as theosis. That's at the heart of Christianity. Think about it. When I celebrate the Mass, you all don't hear this prayer I say, but when I'm preparing the chalice at the altar, I mix a little bit of water into the wine. And I say, by the mystery of this water and wine, may we become sharers of the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. That's one of the prayers of the Mass, but we say it sotto voce in a silent voice, a soft voice that people in the congregation aren't supposed to hear. Uh, but that's a little prayer we say after the, you know, when, when I'm mixing the chalice. Notice the priest pours just a tiny bit of water into that wine. What happens when he does that? Well, that water, and it's interesting because I see it mixing in the chalice, uh, that water, when it, you can see it mixing because when you pour just a little shot, just a very little amount goes into that wine and it immediately just is absorbed into the wine and becomes the wine. Uh, so 2 Peter 1.4, thank goodness it made it into the New Testament, this sweet little letter, because that verse alone is humongous. And it's it's can be stitched together with a lot of interesting quotes that, um, that it goes kind of with. Um, you know, I could spend some time looking at those, you know, like we, uh, no one born of God commits sin for God's nature abides in us. God's seed, literally his seed. Um, we've been born anew. Uh, into the family of God. God's nature abides in him. We're going to hear that in 1 John. Uh, I'll just stop there, but there's lots of things, uh, different scripture passages. We can look at it alongside 2 Peter 1, 4, but this is the most explicit text which describes uh, how, we, how radical of a thing it is to say that we are the children of God. That means we are literally sharing his nature. Now, moving down the line, confirm your call. I love the humility of Peter here. You know, I intend always to remind you by way of reminder. He says that throughout this letter, you know, he knows we've already heard all this stuff. Most of what we preach on Sundays, everybody's already heard, you know. All it is is a timely reminder. I love that how uh, Peter, you know, recognizes and acknowledges that. Now he speaks about his departure. I will see to it that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things that I'm reminding you about. Listen to what St. Peter says there. Very interesting. Departure It's how it's translated in English in my translation, but the Greek word is exodon from the word exodos. Yes, that's where we get the English word exodus. Exodus. Guess where it appears in the New Testament? 
at the uh, transfiguration when Jesus in, Ma in Luke's gospel, chapter 9, verse 31, he is speaking to Moses and Elijah about the exodus that he is about to accomplish. They're speaking to him about the exodus that he's about to accomplish in Jerusalem where he, the new Moses, is going to lead this new Israel out of bondage and slavery to sin, death, and the devil into the true promised land of heaven. Okay, this is what Christianity is in a nutshell, a new exodus, a way out, ex hodos in Greek, prepositional prefix, out of with this word way, hodos, ex hodos, the way out. That's what Christianity is, folks. And here's St. Peter knows that he's not long for this world, that he's referring to his ex hodos. I'm, I'm going to get this last little letter in here to y'all before my uh, exodus, so that you may be able at any time to recall these things. And then what does he talk about right after that? This exodus that our Lord experiences, experienced in Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, the... the um, speaking to Moses and Elijah about his exodus at the transfiguration. Now, what is the very next thing St. Peter's going to talk about in chapter 1? The exodus event. And he's going to refer immediately. No sooner does he say the word exodus uh, or departure than he's going to say, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ because... We were witnesses to his majesty. He's talking about the transfiguration. Where they heard the voice of the majestic glory born from the cloud. This is my beloved son. Okay, he's eyewitness here. He's speaking about being an eyewitness. Just like he did in the first letter. He said, uh, you know, he refers to having... Uh, been a witness to the suffering, a witness of the suffering of Christ. Uh, he was a witness to the sufferings of Christ, he said in the first letter. Um, uh, that means an eyewitness. And now in 2 Peter, he says, I was there at the transfiguration. There's only three guys there, Peter, James, and John. So that's another cause to believe that this was written by Peter um, because, I don't know, for somebody to write this suit of uh, they would have pseudonymically, uh, they would have to be flat out, you know, pretending to be that individual in a very explicit way, referring to real events uh, that he was an eyewitness to that they were not. I mean, when it gets really explicit like that, it gives you cause to doubt that somebody um, would have been so um, um, uh, bold as to uh, make these claims not having been eyewitnesses themselves. We did not follow cleverly devised myths. Christianity is not a cleverly devised myth. I love saying that. This is not something man-made. That's what I get from this. That's what St. Peter wants to impress on us. This is not a man-made invented religion concocted by human beings. Uh, we didn't invent this thing. Okay, we're just responding to what God did. God took the initiative. This whole thing is the impetus of Almighty God getting involved with us down here. He's saying, look, we didn't make this thing up. It's not a cleverly devised myth like the Greeks wrote. Christianity is not a myth. Don't let anybody tell you that. And if they do, quote 2 Peter here, 1.16. I'm not following some cleverly devised myth. It's based on eyewitness testimony factual historical accounts of God's involvement in the history of the human race, particularly coming into this world of the Son of God. And thousands of people witnessed it. Now, um, no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation because no prophecy ever came by the impulse of man, but men moved by the Spirit spoke from God. That is a strong statement about the radical nature of inspiration of Scripture. Uh, that this is one of the most important texts uh, when we talk about inspiration, literally inspired. The Spiritus breathed into us, inspired. Um, that's what happens when people uh, write the Scriptures. Now, they're not uh, those who, sacred authors, human authors, who wrote the 
these works of the Bible. Um, they're not just recording. That's why they're all so different. It's not like they just write down on a typewriter whatever they hear whispered in their ear. That's not the church's understanding of inspiration. But they are moved, but in such a way that it, it happens in and through their personality, their background, their culture, their whole experience, life experience comes out. It is refracted through them as a human person in their totality. That's why they're not uniformly written all the way from one end to the other, all 72, 73 books. They're coming through, refracted through all these different human authors, but they're all inspired by the same Holy Spirit. Now he's going to hammer the false prophets all through chapter 2, and I don't even think I'm going to say anything about that, except that he connects the lust of defiling passion and the despising of authority. It seems as though lust, sexual immorality, impurity, porneia, uh, and rebelliousness towards authority, despising authority, those two things seem to go together. I can't help but thinking of the 60s. Question authority and free love. I mean, make love, not war. Uh, boy, the 60s was a time of rebellion against authority and sexual promiscuity and immorality, and that's exactly uh, the kind of thing that uh, Peter's talking about here. All right, how ungodly uh, that is. Sorry to you baby boomers out there, but uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, read that sometime. Now, um, I've aroused you, your sincere mind, by way of reminder, scoffers will come, following their own passions, questioning when the Lord's going to return. Where is the promise of his coming? He's not coming back. Let's do whatever we want. Live for the day. Libertinism. Um, and a thousand years as one day. Lord's going to come like a thief in the night. We've been hearing that. New heavens and a new earth. I love that. Uh, just like, um, um, well, like St. Paul says in Romans 8, I mean, this idea that uh, the, the whole of the cosmos is, is tied up with us in our, our redemption. The story of our redemption is going to involve the whole of the cosmos ultimately. Um, is powerful. Uh, new heavens and a new earth. That's um, part of the doctrine of the faith. Uh, now, we already made reference to the end of 2 Peter here where he refers to the letters that Paul wrote and the wisdom with which our beloved brother Paul wrote to us. But some of these things are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Let's move on to Jude. All right, let's get into the letter of Jude, the last letter of the New Testament. And we're tacking it on to 1 and 2 Peter because it's similar, very similar to 2 Peter, chapter 2 specifically of 2 Peter. It's very similar to Jude. It's only one chapter long. And it's uh, written sometime in the 50s to the 90s. We don't even know because we don't know when this human author died. We have no record of uh, when he died. And who is this author, BTW? Well, there are two different Judes, or should we say Judases, because that's the Semitic name, okay? Um, two different Judases, and uh, they were both apostles, um, Judas Iscariot, and then this Judas who always distinguishes himself, Judas not Iscariot, okay? Um, and this Jude who's writing this letter is neither of those according to most scripture scholars. They actually think it's the Jude who is the brother of James. And it makes sense because that's the way he introduces himself. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. So there was another brother of the Lord, similar to James. So this is the brother of the guy who we believe, most scholars believe, wrote this letter of James, the first of the Catholic epistles. And the seventh of the seven Catholic epistles are written by two brothers bookending these little seven epistles at the end of the New Testament. So Jude. Now, um, in the West, they thought that these were the cousins of our Lord. In other words, not of the same mother and father uh, at all. 
Uh, whereas in the East, they thought that they might be stepbrothers. In other words, that perhaps Joseph was married before he was married to Mary and had kids from a previous marriage so that they were somehow like stepbrothers um, to our Lord when it says the brothers of the Lord because there's room within that term Adelphoi uh, for both uh, possibilities. So who knows? Who knows? Emergency dispatch. That's what's the, This is an emergency dispatch to address the problem of heresy in the church and division. Uh, and he's going to use a lot of biblical stories, and he's going to also use some stories that are non-biblical that we'll look at. Um, that's very interesting. He, you're going to be reading along, and you're going to be like, what the heck's he talking about when he's talking about uh, Moses and um, the archangel arguing with the devil, with Satan and all this stuff. Well, that comes from uh, this ancient, this Jewish writing called the Assumption of Moses, uh, that he's relating a story about Satan and the archangel, St. Michael, arguing um, over Moses. And this is from a non-biblical writing called the Assumption of Moses that he's assuming everybody's heard of. And then he's also going to quote first Enoch, uh, author here. Jude is going to quote another non-biblical uh, text, First Enoch, uh, when he describes this uh, relating of the concer concerning the falling of the angels. So he's going to talk about the fall and punishment of the angels um, <clears throat> by quoting from First Enoch in relation to these false teachers. Uh, by way of example, to show them you're not going to get away with this, folks. The demons didn't get away with it. You're not going to get away with this. Uh, there's going to be a judgment on you, boss. And uh, what are the themes in this letter? Contend. This is a famous passage from Jude that a lot of people think of. When they think of Jude, you think of this verse right here, chapter, well, there's only one chapter. Verse 3, contend for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Guard and keep it. That's a word that he's going to use a lot in this letter. Second little theme here is this word keep. He uses it five times. Uh, fulasso. Fulasso is a very important word when you consider uh, all the way back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, uh, when God instructs Adam to till and keep the garden. Guess what the word keep is in the uh, Greek rendering of the Hebrew word shamar. Uh, the Greek rendering in the Septuagint translation of that Hebrew word shamar is phulasso. In other words, keep has a connotation of guard. It's translated both ways. In 1 Timothy 6, uh, 20, he actually uh, uses the same word. Paul uses that word, and when he says to Timothy in 1 Tim, 1 Timothy 6.20, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. Fulasso. Same word God used to, um, uh, or in the Septuagint translation of Genesis 2.15, keep this garden, Adam. Okay, in other words, guard it. Um, that's the word that uh, Jude is so fond of in this letter. Um, and let's see, mercy is, uh, another theme. So we can't just say he's just, he has no heart. Peter is tough, but he has a tender heart as well. A merciful, tender heart. And God is that way. He gives, shows tough love, but he is a softy underneath too. Uh, so we can't be too sentimental. We can't be too sentimental. That's why it has to be reined in. Uh, sentimentalism is, uh, can lead to grave errors in our thinking and in our judgment about God and the things of God. We can't be ruled simply by our feelings and what feels right to me. Well, I really love him, Mom. Dad, I, we love each other. And I'm trying to defend your actions, which are clearly immoral, moving in with your boyfriend. Uh, but, you know, you're defending yourself based on your feelings. Your very sincere feelings are wrong in God's eyes. So feelings can be a very dangerous thing um, to, to, to base our moral judgments on. 
Um, and they can also influence our doctrinal judgments, uh, can be led astray by sentimentalism, where we think uh, God is so merciful, God's not going to judge. Uh, this notion of God as some sort of Santa Claus, some sort of Barney the Purple Dinosaur, whatever, some sentimentalized notion of who God is. When we say God is love, this can actually undermine, really um, erode uh, the truth of our doctrine, of our faith, that we must contend for and build ourselves up in our most holy faith, St. Jude is going to say. Uh, I want to stop this thing because it's going on for so long. He refers to love feasts, which could be a reference to the Eucharist. Uh, I think I've hit most everything I want to hit, except uh, this uh, idea of saving. That you know, when you convince some who doubt, uh, you know, you're saving them by snatching them out of the fire. That we are saviors within the Savior. I've said before, uh, we can be, and Paul more or less said the same thing. First uh, Timothy four sixteen. Remember at the, uh, he said. Uh, that uh, 1 Timothy 4, 16. Yeah, practice these duties. Take heed to yourself and to your teaching. Hold fast to that, for by doing so you will save both yourself and your hearers. You know, there's one Savior who saves, but he saves in and through us uh, a lot of times. So it's kind of neat to think that we can help save somebody's eternal life. That's the awesomeness of being a fisher of men. Um, so... Letter of Jude, Second Peter, very eschatological in nature and closely associated with Second Thessalonians. When you think of eschatology and the end times, the final judgment, you think of uh, oftentimes Jude, Second Peter, and Second Thessalonians come to mind. I'm going to end this now, and uh, we'll take up in a new, fresh video, first, second, and third letters of John. God bless you.